So I'm here with Derek Mahoney. Derek Mahoney is a, I'd say Derek, you're one of the most famous non-mainstream orthodontists in Australia. Yeah, now you did your training in the UK, so you are a qualified orthodontist and you have had a lot of flack because not only are you non-mainstream, you're not just following the, the traditional method of orthodontics, but you're teaching it. And you're teaching it to non-orthodontists, to dentists. So it's given you, I think you've had slightly undue flack for that. I always learned from what Robert Ricketts taught me and he said, I don't care if the cleaner wants to come to my lecture, if he learns something that helps the general public at large, why not? And I've always held the view that um, I was lucky to do a postgraduate education, but that doesn't mean that we as a profession are the font of all knowledge. And I have very good general dentists who do amazing orthodontics. Mm. And um, in a country like Australia, with a huge population spread over a vast area, not everyone can get to a specialist orthodontist. Yeah. Um, so I really am passionate in that um, everyone who wants to learn has a right to learn. Now, I was very impressed with the, the, the recent work you've been doing and some of the statistics you were given today. It was, it was amazing me. It was. Do you want to, do I cover, vaguely cover a little bit of this? Yeah. So over the last 15 years, I've been collecting data on patients referred to me for orthodontic care. We limited our research protocols to children between age seven and nine, who had been referred in purely for treatment of malocclusion by uh, a dentist, uh, by a medical doctor, by an enos and throat doctor, by word of mouth, whatever way they came to the practice. Yeah. But one thing I did differently um, is I asked all these patients to have a sleep study. Um, and I looked at the correlation between those who had a malocclusion and those who had what's called sleep disorder breathing problems. And I thought, you know, based on previous research I've read, which they really only gave a patient a, um, a sleep questionnaire uh, rather than an actual sleep study. And they showed sort of 17% to maybe 30% of children who had a malocclusion had um, sleep disorder breathing problems. In our data, which is a huge sample, um, we were showing 92 percent mm -hmm. and that's because we measured not just the apneic events or the hypopneic events we also measured uh, the resistance so the RDI mm -hmm. uh, and that picked up a lot of kids who may not have apnea in the way it's defined but certainly had problems breathing because they had nasal problems uh, well, etc. Clearly with my, my, always my concern with sleep apnea it, it's a constructed definition. Correct. So many of these, so many of those times by that add on one of those and yeah. we've got yeah. our product and that doesn't fit everyone. Absolutely and even uh, Christian Gumner who you know, is the father of sleep medicine mm. and who developed this AHI, um, he says, don't treat to the numbers, you know, look at the individual. And he's very passionate at Stanford in looking at um, the muscles and the, and the posture of the tongue as methods to help um, uh, limit collapse of the airway at night. Mm. Where do you see yourself going now with this? Where, where, where's, where's the goal with this PhD? You know, what's, you know, you, you clearly got a passion about this. And I think that breathing and breathing issues have added a new dimension to what we've always been talking about. Absolutely. I think I would like our profession, the orthodontics, uh, to realize that we're losing our profession to technology. I mean, nowadays patients can make their own aligners, as you well know. Well, yeah, right? I mean... So, 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 so if a patient views an orthodontist purely as a tooth straightener, I mean, we're, we're, we're not in the marketplace. Every general dentist does uh, Invisalign, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. But I think where our profession should be going is looking at the correlation between children's sleep and their malocclusion. And as we know, we've debated this many times and your father has been at the forefront of linking malocclusion to epigenetic problems rather than genetic problems. Mm. And um, oh, environmental. Environmental and, yep. and postural. Yep. And uh, to me, let's add airway to that. Yeah, well, it's, it's an important, you know, um, I've been talking about this concept of trying to link it together with this concept of craniofacial dystrophy. Yes, and saying yes. that it, it, it's, it's a global structural change with the face and yep. the airway is one of the other symptoms. So we list out the symptoms, many ENT problems, many airway problems and of course crooked teeth. But we need to come out of this sort of limited viewpoint to see the greater. Yes. I mean, they'll see the whole. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think 
When I saw a parent, a CBCT that shows the three-dimensional airway, show them how narrow their child's airway is, and I show a repeat CBCT after I finish my uh, orthopedic correction, and they see not just a better looking face and more room for the teeth, but what they really see is a change in that child's behavior. You know, they're performing better at school, they're sleeping better. And many parents say to me, Dr. Mahoney, thank you, my kids' teeth look amazing, but thank you more so for giving me back a new child. Mm. And I think that's powerful. You know, when you talk to a parent about airway problems and sleep in their children, it's always more, um, they, they, they understand that more than they understand at what age should we straighten our child's teeth. Yes. It's a shame that many parents of children with sleep issues have no idea about what we're saying. Exactly, exactly. And I think we as orthodontists are the prime people to pick up things in the mouth that are indicative of sleep disorder breathing. The narrow palate, the crossbite, the bruxism, uh, the large tonsils. When I graduated from orthodontic school, we looked at just the teeth. And in fact, our job was to get everything into angles, you know, class one, six keys. And what I realized now, you can do that and bring that back here in the face, and that's not good for the child. We need people to know what you have found because it's another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And it all fits together very, very nicely. And I think one thing that I'd like the orthodontists to pick up from this study is when they take a lateral CEF, if they're even not going to do a CBCT, measure hyoid bone position. Look yeah. at position of maxilla. I think we've got to get away from this SNA being 82 degrees concept, really. Yes. Um, we've got to understand that the position of the maxilla is the most important thing when it comes to the child's airway. And why are all these children that I've been seeing with malocclusions have undeveloped arches and retronathic maxillas, mandibles, it's because of their breathing. And uh, yeah. you know, we, we see well, it's that. Because of the, this, this change in structural form. Yeah. There's a global change in structural form. Yeah. We just, people almost don't want to believe that their face, whole facial form isn't correct. I, I There's a huge resistance I to this. Agree. And I think that when this happens, this psychological change in the mind, well, I, I often say this is of only interest to people who have a face. <laughs> All the people with that face is, they're, they're not interested in this. The, the way their facial form is, that, that, who they think they are, that image on their passport, when they clock, that may not be how their full genetic potential. Correct. When people recognise that, then I think changes. Then we will, we've will gone over the um, point of maximum resistance and it will be, everyone will, they want, the people want to hear this. Yeah. And it's in their interest to hear this. Absolutely. You know, it's, 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 it's health, it's appearance, and I think I wouldn't go too far, you know, as, as you were talking about education, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably even longevity. Yeah. So if malocclusion's far worse now, what's the predictor of what's going to happen? And if you link that on what is the cost on the health budget of misdiagnosed and untreated OSA? Well, the sleep apnea goes, it's so permeating, you know, if you, they often say that if you could sell a quality sleep as a pill, it mm. would be the biggest selling drug on the planet. Absolutely. The quality sleep, not the sort of stuff you can get with a sleeping tons. Correct. But, you know, we're talking about, you know, there's a concept where, you know, obesity, you know, do you become, do obese people become sleep apneic? Or, if you're sleep apneic, do you crave the types of food that make you obese? Well, there's lots of research to link um, uh, the hormonal changes associated with poor sleep, not getting into stage three uh, non-rapid eye movement, deep sleep. Um, and um, you're, you're right, uh, uh, the, the body's natural uh, appetite suppressant, right, uh, is not released when you have uh, uh, poor, poor mm. sleep. So I think um, it is that scenario, this vicious cycle, where people are not sleeping while they're eating more, and then as they're eating more, their obesity is contributing to their apnea. I know the latest research would say, if you can reduce your BMI by 10%, you can reduce your um, AHI by a third. That's huge. Mm, huge, you know? And yet, what's the two things we're seeing more in modern society? More malocclusion, more obesity.
more OSA. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, 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 bang. bang. We could, we're not totally certain which is following which. Exactly. No, we, exactly. it's still a grey area, which we need more research, and to get yeah. more research, we need more publicity. And this is not even talking about the relationship with diabetes, yes. and it's not even talking about the relationship with car, car, cardiovascular issues. Absolutely. You know, that, that's leaving those aside. Yeah. And then, clearly, with the concept with ADH may be leading to sleep apnea. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, ADHD may yeah. be related to sleep apnea. Yes. So, you know, this is a huge topic that just needs some examination. Absolutely. And at Absolutely. the moment, it seems all of the different specialities involved in this are sitting on the side and saying, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. It's just genetic. If it was just genetic, then really, we're all, we're all doomed, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. No, no. no. I firmly believe, and I've been doing this for 30 years in my practice, um, that if you can change a kid's airway by arch development, by maxillary protraction, by whatever, you definitely see an improvement in that child's mm. sleep, their performance at school, um, you know, and better looking faces, which, which is yeah, yeah, uh, what yeah. we've discussed yeah, we've years discussed, ago. Yes, yeah, no, and I mean, this is my dad's mission for so long. Yeah. And, uh, but listen, Derek, thank you very much on that.